Okay, I think we can we can probably get started. It looks like the number of participants has stabilized. So uh, I'd like to welcome everybody uh, to this uh, hematopathology community of interest uh, session, I guess we'll call it. And uh, it is my pleasure to be the moderator for this session. I'm uh, Dr. Adam Smith from the University Health Network. And uh, we'll be doing a couple of presentations today. So our first presentation uh, will be the one you can see on the screen uh, with a couple of case presentations and some also some discussion about the um, some changes, potential changes in molecular testing required by the new disease classification. So um, without further ado, I will take this opportunity to introduce uh, Dr. Rashmi Goswami. Uh, Dr. Goswami is going to be talking about uh, the WHO HEM5 and ICC classifications for mature B-cell lymphomas. Uh, Dr. Goswami uh, did her medical training at the University of Toronto, followed by a residency at McGill University and molecular and hematopathology fellowships at the uh, ND Anderson Cancer Center in Texas. And it is my pleasure to, for her to present to us today and welcome Dr. Goswami. Thanks so much, Adam. Um, so yeah, I'm really happy to talk to you today about the new um, WHO and ICC classifications for mature B-cell lymphomas. Um, uh, these these came out for both the myeloid and uh, lymphoid malignancies, and they're um, they're they're caught they they can cause a little bit of a confusion as to what uh, how to classify um, our previously classifiable um, heme malignancies. So I uh, just wanted to give you an overview of what we're going to be talking about today. So I'll, I'll just give a little bit of an introduction of um, the WHO and ICC classifications. Um, so I decided to focus on the mature B-cell lymphomas. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a small selection of what um, is in the classification systems. There are new entities that are in there that um, I did not touch on. They're, they're quite rare, but um, I felt that I would just uh, talk about um, the lymphomas that we're likely to see in day-to-day in -day practice. Um, but, uh, uh, we can we can discuss more about uh, any other lymphomas that um, we're interested in in the discussion afterwards. Um, and then after this overview of the uh, B cell lymphomas, uh, I'm just going to shortly touch on uh, immune deficiency and dysregulation associated LPDs um, because the way that they're being reported now is. Uh, slightly different from what, what they were in the prior uh, WHO classification. And then this will be followed by a conclusion, as well as I'm hoping for a short discussion with the audience about um, where we see <clears throat> lymphoma testing going uh, in the future, as I'm, kind, I, I'm, I'm interested to see what the community thinks and um, potentially what we might want to provide uh, with regard to lymphoma diagnostics and prognostics. Um, so to just give you a little bit of an overview, uh, so the fifth edition of the WHO came out uh, uh, with a publication last year, as well as uh, the um, ICC classification, which was also published um, shortly afterwards, a few months later. Um, so the WHO released their overview of the fifth edition of the classification of hematolymphoid tumors in May of 2022, um, followed by <clears throat> Uh, a beta version of this classification uh, online, which I turn to quite frequently <laughs> since it's uh, it's quite new and, and trying to put uh, together diagnoses uh, that fit with that classification um, often requires references. Um, so the ICC, the International Consensus Classification of Mature Lymphoid Neoplasms was um, submitted uh, from the Clinical Advisory Committee, which was a, an international committee um, that was organized after a um, European Society of Hematology meeting. Um, and that, um, that classification system was basically released in September of 2022. So, um, oh, sorry. Um, so both classifications uh, base are based on the classification of a disease entity on distinctive pathological, clinical, and when available molecular features. So that's common to both. Um, and for the most part, most of them, uh, or both classification systems are, are similar to one another, but there are some slight changes and I'll, I'll, go, into, uh, I'll go into some of those. Um, so the overall differences between the two classification systems, 
So provisional ent entities were not considered in the fifth edition of the WHO. So most of the provisional entities in the, in the fourth edition have been upgraded to definite, definite entities. Um, whereas in the ICC, uh, a lot of them have been left provisional. Uh, there, I, I won't go into the subclassifications of plasma cell myeloma in this talk, um, but in the ICC, the subclassifications for plasma cell myeloma or multiple myeloma, as it's known in the ICC, are based on cytogenetic findings that are not included in the WHO in the current WHO. Um, the, the fifth edition of the WHO also includes a section on transformations of indolent B cell lymphoma. So here's where you would qualify a lymphoma that you diagnose if it was transformed from an indolent form um, based on clinical history or um, concomitant um, presentation. Um, but that is not considered um, in the ICC. Um, and then this is what I was hoping to touch on in this talk, um, which are uh, which are these category categories of essential and desirable diagnostic criteria for each entity. So these are discussed in the fifth edition of the WHO, and there's a section on desirable diagnostic criteria, which often includes molecular criteria. And the reason that they were made desirable and not essential, for the most part, there are some exceptions, are um, is because the, the um, authors of the WHO did recognize that not all laboratories have the capacity for um, this type of ancillary laboratory testing. And so they want to give people, I guess, um, an out if they aren't able to actually get this ancillary testing and or catch up at some point um, in order to actually make it, um, uh, in order to make it, uh, essential later on. So, uh, and that's something that I wanted to discuss was to see whether or not uh, we think that the desirable diagnostic criteria are, some, uh, are something that we can prepare for in the near future. Um, so we'll start off with uh, one of the more common um, entities in hematolymphoid tumors. So uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia and small lymphocytic lymphoma. So the diagnostic criteria for CLL, SLL are the same in both classification systems. Um, however, there's like some small tweaks. So accelerated CLL is recognized by both the WHO and the um, uh, ICC. However, the fifth edition of the WHO considers this to involve two, two entities. So the first one is considered a histolog histologically aggressive CLL SLL. So here are cases in which um, if you have the lymph node in front of you, they'll have large confluent proliferation centers, often um, uh, which are quite large and can take up the 20x field, or they can uh, contain proliferation centers with greater than 40% uh, Ki67 positive cells. Um, so the so this was a criteria in the fourth edition, um, and they've now labeled this histologically aggressive. Um, the small change that they've made is that they also consider accelerated, CS, uh, accelerated CLL to involve pro-lymphocytic progression with greater than 15% pro-lymphocytes. So this is actually um, pro, like what they consider uh, pro-lymphocytic progression is a way of eliminating um, the pro-lymphocytic um, leukemia as an entity. So in the WHO uh, fifth edition, you won't see um, BPLL as an entity anymore. Um, the other thing that was mentioned in uh, the ICC and the WHO is that you can get Richter-like transformation. So you can get large sheets of large cells um, with the interruption of ibrutinib, which is uh, quite commonly used in the treatment of CLL nowadays. And uh, what's what one needs to know is that this can be reversible after the reintroduction of ibrutinib. And so um, this needs to be kept in mind uh, when looking at a sample that looks like it could possibly uh, have Richter transformation um, because the history of whether or not the patient's been on ibrutinib and whether or not it's been interrupted is, is crucial to um, making that diagnosis. Um, so, in so, so this is, uh, these are what the WHO considers essential and desirable with regard to CLL diagnosis. So the essential criteria are that one has classic CLL morphology as well as an absolute B cell count greater than five. 
Um, so as we all know, CLL has uh, typical flow cytometry markers, and here they consider the essential ones to be 5, 23, 19, and 20, as well as weakly expressed monotypic light chain. Um, in terms of immunohistochemistry, um, CLL is usually positive for CD20, often weak, um, with uh, CD5 expression and variable 23 expression. Um, and then uh, weak positivity of cyclin D1 is allowed in a subset of cells in the proliferation centers, but the majority of these have to be cyclin D1 negative in order to, um, in order to uh, exclude mantle cell lymphoma. So in terms of the flow cytometry, um, these are considered desirable markers. So CD200, ROR1, and CD43. Um, it's often, it's negative for FMC7, um, 79B, CD10, and CD81. And for the immunohistochemistry, chemistry, um, it's, uh, uh, it's LEF1 positive, CD43 positive, and then uh, sometimes MUM1 positive in the proliferation centers, and negative for CD10 and SOX11. Sorry, I don't know why it's not. There we go. Um, so in terms of cytogenetic and molecular studies, uh, the essential cytogenetic markers are for uh, the evaluation of 11Q, 13Q, uh, deletion 17P, and trisomy 12. Um, uh, TP53 mutation analysis is considered also essential, and as well as IGV um, somatic hypermutation analysis and assessment for subsets, for IGV subsets. Um, it, in terms of de desirable cytogenic and molecular studies, uh, I, I'm, and I'd be curious to know this as to whether or not anyone does uh, karyotyping on their CLLs, but Desirable would be the demonstration of a complex karyotype, as well as mutation analysis for uh, genes that are often mutated after uh, therapy, um, as well as prognostic markers such as NOTCH1, SF3B1, and BRCA3. So these, although these are seen in CLL and may have a prognostic value, they're not required. Okay. Um, so then uh, I just like to touch on the prolymphocytic leukemia. Um, so this is an entity that's been eliminated from the fifth edition of the WHO. And um, in the fourth edition of the WHO, this was characterized by a high white count with greater than 55% prolymphocytes, splenomegaly, um, ab minimal or absent lymphadenopathy, and a fairly aggressive course. Um, so the WHO fifth edition has actually um, considered this a heterogeneous category composed of a very for of various different types of leukemias and lymphomas. So um, they uh, believe that some hairy cell leukemia variants have been um, misdiagnosed as BPLL, leukemic mantle cell lymphoma, as well as a prolymphocytic progression of CL CLL. Um, so it's all been subsumed into a new category known as splenic B cell le leukemia with prominent nucleoli. Um, so the ICC still considers BPLL as an entity, and it recommends its diagnosis only after having excluded CLL transformation, um, the expression of cyclin D1 and SOX11, so the exclusion of mantle cell lymphoma, um, as well as uh, after the exclusion of the presence of hairy surface projections um, on the uh, atypical lymphocytes, as well as intrasinusoidal bone marrow infiltration. Um, and so this is, that, that criteria is used in order to exclude hairy cell variant and splenic marginal zone lymphoma. Um, so BPLL usually carries a complex karyotype uh, with rearrangement and or increased copy number of MYC, um, deletion 17P, as well as trisomy 18. Uh, it can harbor TP53 mutations and or deletions, and these usually predict poor survival, but they, they usually benefit from BTK inhibitors. And patients that fail BTK inhibitor therapy may still actually respond to venetoclax. Um, so then that brings us to discussing splenic B-cell lymphomas. So uh, the four, uh, sorry, so that basically the four entities that um, I'm going to touch on are uh, or have are touched on in the WHO um, fourth edition are splenic marginal zone lymphoma, hairy cell leukemia, and then what was known as splenic B cell lymphoma leukemia unclassifiable. 
Um, and so under this classification, there were two provisional entities, mainly hairy cell leukemia variants, as well as splenic diffuse red pulp small B cell lymphoma. Um, and this classification is still ma maintained in the ICC. Um, so here's the difference between the WHO um, fourth edition and the fifth edition. So hairy cell leukemia has stayed the same as has splenic marginal zone lymphoma. Um, splenic diffuse red pulp, um, uh, small B cell lymphoma and hairy cell leukemia variant on the other hand have been um, uh, split into different categories. So um, splenic diffuse red pulp disease is part of this splenic B cell uh, lymphoma leukemia with prominent nucleoli, as well as the hairy cell leukemia variant. Um, Oh, sorry. Um, uh, so splenic diffuse red pulp disease is actually still considered splenic diffuse red pulp disease. The hairy cell leukemia variant, as well as BPLL, are now subsumed into splenic B cell lymphoma leukemia with prominent nucleoli. Um, although they, the WHO does contend that there are some mantle cell lymphomas that have been part of the BPLL category, um, as well as prolymphocytic progression of CLL. So that's its own separate um, sort of entity. And then CLL that shows greater than 15% prolymphocytes also um, uh, is considered to be prolymphocytic progression of CLL. So, so um, you don't need 55% prolymphs anymore to make that call. Um, and then here, this kind of uh, shows um, some of the targeted therapies that might be useful um, based on these different entities. So, um, and here's where I'm, I, I, and I'm open to discussion around this. So um, in the fifth edition of the WHO, there's this uh, entity known as uh, splenic B cell leukemia lymphoma with prominent nucleoli and hairy cell leukemia variant has been subsumed into this. Um, so hairy cell leukemia variant does have um, MAP2K uh, kind of, uh, MAP, MAP um, gene mutations and may um, actually show uh, response to MEK inhibitors. So, so I guess that's the question is whether or not this really should be kept separate from, um, from splenic B cell lymphoma with prominent nucleoli. Um, so that's a question that we can keep in mind. Um, and then uh, BPLL uh, can be targeted with various uh, treatments um, such as ibrutinib and venetoclax, as I mentioned before. And, H and hairy cell leukemia has basically stayed the same. Um, so then just, uh, so just to touch on splenic B cell uh, leukemia lymphoma with prominent nucleoli. So um, as I mentioned before, hairy cell leukemia variant and B prolymphocytic leukemia are now part of this category. Um, so, the, so this has actually been pulled from the WHO um, uh, online version. Um, and so basically the essential criteria are that you have circulating medium-sized lymphoid cells with prominent nucleoli or convoluted nuclei. Um, rare cells in the peripheral blood can show uh, poorly defined cytoplasmic projections, as well as um, they, although they, they show the projections, hairy projections that are typical for hairy cell leukemia are absent. So the fine villi that you see um, in hairy cell leukemia are not in this uh, entity. Um, it shows the presence of B cell antigens, uh, 1920, 79A, or PAX5, an absence of the characteristic phenotype of hairy cell leukemia, which includes the expression of CD25, annexin A1, cyclin D1, and TRAP. Um, so, in terms of the desirable criteria, sorry, in terms of the desirable criteria, uh, diffuse involvement of the red pulp with atrophic white pulp is. Um, would would be uh, one of the criteria that could be used, but chances are this is usually seen on a peripheral blood or um, or a bone marrow biopsy, and so um, spleen like spleens are rarely taken out for this for this entity, so that, that's why it's considered a desirable criteria. And then as well, um, keeping it uh, separate from hairy cell leukemia, there's the absence of BRAF. Um, so splenic diffuse red pulp small B cell lymphoma. So that's now instead of a provisional category in the WHO fourth edition, it's now become a definitive entity in the fifth. Um, and so this has a few essential criteria. So here you uh, would see diffuse infiltration of the spleen with uh, atrophic white pulp, although um, so, 
this this call is hard to make unless you have the spleen, obviously. Um, so the peripheral blood usually contains circulating small cells with uh, abundant cytoplasm as well as polar um, cytoplasmic villus projections, usually one to four, as well as an inconspicuous nucleolus. And this is what separates it from the previous entity. Um, it's positive for B cell markers and cyclin D3, um, negative for cyc for uh, CL markers such as 5 and 23, as well as 43, negative for cyclin D1, um, negative for CD21, 25, and exon A1. Um, it can sometimes be positive for CD11C, um, and rare cases have been shown to have positivity for 103 and CD123, similar to hairy cell. Um, what is new in this um, in this classification is that flow cytometry for CD180 has, is quite useful in, in diagnosing this because in conjunction with CD200, um, you can uh, calculate a ratio of the mean fluorescence intensity of the two markers and an MFI less than 0 0.5 is considered, excuse me, is considered um, to be one of the criteria for uh, diagnosis of this entity. Um, what's desirable is the absence of BRAF, uh, V600E, and as well as the absence of lymphadenopathy other than splenic hyalur lymph nodes. Um, so then, so this entity, as I said, is now not in the WHO, but for the ICC, they still consider it a separate entity. Um, it's characterized similarly to the other um, entities by Mark splenomegaly, as well as lymphocytosis, circulating tumor cells with a morphology that's intermediate between hairy cells and prolymphocytes and a lack of monocytopenia. Um, so the neoplastic B cells express 11C and 103, but not 25 and an X and A1. And as I mentioned before, uh, MAP2K1 uh, is... Um, has a hotspot mutation uh, in uh, at residue 121, and that's been detected in up to 50% of cases. Um, and so it, this may be um, this may be responsive to MEK inhibitor therapy as a result, or at least those cases with uh, the uh, MAP2 kinase one um, mutation uh, would be. And BRAF V600E is usually not identified. Um, and then sort of rounding, rounding this out. So the majority of the criteria for lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma have, have not really changed, but I did want to mention this because um, they do mention some uh, desirable molecular criteria. And I, and um, I just wanted to gauge the audience's um, thoughts on that. Um, so the essential criteria are uh, bone marrow infiltration by greater than 10% small lymphocytes with plasma cytoid and or plasma cell differentiation. Um, so the immunophenotype of the LPL cells uh, is as, as outlined with um, obvious um, expression of B cell markers, uh, lack of CD10, uh, lack of CD103 and 23, and uh, equivocal CD138. Um, so the desirable criteria include the detection of an MYD88, although that's not hard and fast because some LPLs will show um, negativity for MYD88 and will show downstream mutations um, in, uh, in relevant pathways. So uh, CXCR4 is also considered a desirable mutation, but um, uh, and, and it's important it's important that it's actually recognized because it does influence um, a patient's prognosis and their time to treat, as well as their resistance to ibrutinib therapy. Um, it's interesting they put it in the desirable category, but I think that this is just it, to acknowledge the fact that not all laboratories may have the capacity for CXCR4 mutation analysis. And then also desirable is serum electrophoresis and immunofixation um, showing presence of a monoclonal IgM. Uh, I just wanted to mention, I, I, I forgot to mention this at the beginning, but I, I'm, I'm kind of glossing over all of these lymphomas and not going through all of the different criteria, just because I'm assuming most people know them in this audience, but um, feel free to comment in the chat if you have questions with regard to morphologic criteria or anything like that. Um, so 
lymphocyte, lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma in the ICC, by contrast, is uh, interesting because here they actually suggest that you can diagnose this with uh, less than 10% cellularity of the trephine biopsy. So basically, if you see abnormal lymphoplasmacytic aggregates, but they, um, but they together uh, comprise less than 10% of the cellularity, according to ICC criteria, you can still call this LPL. Um, with a few caveats. One of them is that you need definitive evidence of clonal B cells and plasma cells. Um, and as well, uh, molecular studies for MYD88 and CXCR mutations are strongly encouraged. They don't say that they're um, necessary, but um, it, is, uh, it is strongly recommended in the ICC criteria. Okay. So now we're going to move to another very um, common category, which is follicular lymphoma. So the WHO fifth edition rec recognizes, uh, so here, here's where some of the major changes have been made. So um, there's, uh, there's a recognition of several morphologic subtypes of follicular lymphoma. So there's the one that we've, we've kind of uh, come to know. <laughs> Um, through experience, which is cl our classic follicular lymphoma. Um, but then they've added a few uh, new entities. So one is follicular lymphoma with, quote, unusual features. Um, and I'll go into what that means a little in, in a slide or two. Uh, follicular lymphoma with a predominantly diffuse growth pattern, and this is a specific entity. And then finally, follicular large B-cell lymphoma. So the WHO uh, the newest edition of the WHO does not make it mandatory to grade, and they um, stated that this is because of a lack of reproducibility in counting centroblasts, and I, I feel like we've all kind of <laughs> um, seen that, like in our day-to-day -day practice. Um, as well, there's no definitive evidence to support the distinction between um, follicular lymphoma grades 1 to 3A, but the ICC maintains the morphologic rating for follicular lymphoma and suggests that um, because 3A and 3B are treated so differently, because 3B is considered to be very similar to uh, diffuse uh, large B cell lymphoma, that it's really important to grade and to, um, and to make that distinction. Um, it might be a moot point because uh, what used to be follicular 3B is now considered follicular large B cell lymphoma. So on some level, you're still making that call. Um, it's just that you don't actually have to count. Um, you don't actually have to count the cells in order to grade. Um, so classic follicular lymphoma. So this is the one that we see quite often. Um, it's composed of centrocytes. Um, and here you can see in the red arrows. Um, so these are abnormal lymphocytes that are often slightly larger than our background benign lymphocytes um, with more open chromatin. Um, and they often have angulated, twisted, or cleaved nuclei. Um, and then in the with the black arrows here, you can see these are centroblasts um, uh, and lar or immunoblasts. So centroblasts or immunoblasts. And centroblasts are usually large cells that are three times the size of normal lymphocytes um, with rounded oval nuclei, vesicular chromatin, and um, peripherally located nuclei, nucleoli. Um, and what they uh, label as transformed oblastic cells are um, immunoblasts um, with similar chromatin and often a very single prominent nucleolus. And they're often found as a minority of the larger cells within the neoplastic follicle. Okay, so then this, uh, so then there's this new entity known as follicular lymphoma with unusual features. And so then this is usually composed of medium sized cells and they, they can have either immature or blastoid chromatin, or you can have large cells that have cleaved or ir irregular nuclei, uh, nuclei. So these, these, these ones with the cleaved or irregular nuclei actually look like very large centrocytes. And so both of these cells basically are um, considered uh, unusual features of follicular lymphoma and they and and may need to be um, discussed in the diagnosis. So uh, usually these lymphomas have a higher KI67 proliferation index and often um, increased MUM1 expression. Uh, BCL2 rearrangement is lower in these uh, entities and the diagnosis may require a negative um, uh, 
negative IR4 fish, because if MUM1 is strongly expressed, then the possibility of a uh, large cell lymphoma with um, IR4 needs to be excluded. So the prognosis of these cases um, might differ from, uh, from our classic follicular lymphoma, but um, since it, it hasn't been sort of carved out as an entity before, um, it's unknown. And so I think the WH uh, the authors of the WHO are hoping that by defining it in this way, then if there are clinical, like uh, any clinical, um, significant clinical differences from classical follicular lymphoma, then those can be teased out. Um, so yeah, so this is, this, this entity has been described in the past. It's just that um, usually they've been small case reports or case series and um, and, and no one's actually uh, taken it out as like a, an entity for to, to study. Um, and then finally, there's follicular, well, not finally, but so there's follicular lymphoma with a predominantly diffuse growth pattern. And so this is, so this is um, uh, an entity that has been described in literature. It's predominantly um, shows a diffuse growth pattern. See, you can see it here. So here's a very diffuse um, lymphoma um, growth with uh, residual germinal centers here. Um, and here you can see that there's absence of an FDC network, but there's like a, but, um, and, and you can see that there's like a, a delineation between the, the normal and the, and this diffuse uh, lymphoma. Um, so, Usually these lymphomas have very strong uh, sheet-like expression of CD23, as well as absence of the uh, traditional um, uh, T1418 translocation that's seen in, um, in classical follicular lymphoma. Um, sometimes you may see FDC remnants, and so these are um, called microfollicles or the residual small follicles. And um, the these um, and the entity actually can, is mainly composed of centrocytes. Um, it's usually a follicular grade, or in, in, the, in the past, it's usually been a follicular grade one or two. Um, although in the residual follicles, you may see um, some centroblasts. CD10 is equivocal. Um, NBCL immunohistochemistry is often weak to absent. Um, it's usually seen in inguinal lymph nodes, and you can see sclerosis and interstitial fibrosis. Uh, even though it can form large masses, it has a very indolent course, and the patients usually have a very limited stage disease. Um, STAT6 mutations are seen in these uh, follicular lymphomas, as well as um, other characteristic mutations, such as CREP-BP, um, uh, TNFRSF14, as well as uh, deletion of 1P36. Um, Fortunately, even if you see a diffuse follicular pattern, if you see it on a core needle biopsy, it's unclear as to whether or not this is just a small component and there's potentially diffuse large B-cell lymphoma elsewhere in the node. So this uh, diagnosis should really not be made on limited biopsy material. And ideally it should, it should be made on a lymph node, <coughs> excuse me. And then finally, there's follicular large B cell lymphoma. So this, this is where the WHO has actually taken away follicular uh, grade 3B, and they've decided to call it follicular large B cell lymphoma. It's considered very closely related to DLBCL and often coexists with it. And so if this is seen um, in, a, in, in a small biopsy sample, then the possibility of concurrent DLBCL should be brought up. And so this is usually characterized by a follicular pattern in which the follicles are composed of sheets of centroblasts in the absence of centrocytes. So here it's really quite difficult to see whether or not this is follicular um, or has a follicular pattern. But if you see um, uh, if you see preservation of FDC networks, CD twenty one and twenty three, then this is most likely um, what used to be a follicular three B and now known as follicular large B cell lymphoma. Um, BCEL2 translocation is uncommon, um, but then because, um, because of its, its association with DLBCL, um, additional testing for BCL6 and MIC rearrangement is recommended. Um, 
uh, uh, IRF for fish is also required if MUM1 is strongly expressed in order to exclude um, large B cell lymphoma with uh, that particular rearrangement. <clears throat> Okay, um, so in terms of the essential criteria in the WHO, um, it's uh, essential that this is uh, to be composed of varying proportions of centrocytes and or centroblasts with a dominance of centrocytes in the overwhelming majority of cases. Obviously that doesn't, um, that doesn't um, keep, that's not in keeping with follicular large B cell lymphoma um, in which centrocytes are rare. The immunophenotype is compatible with a germinal center B origin um, and uh, with uh, uh, positivity for these um, uh, GCB markers. Uh, and desirable is that it should have at least a par partly follicular growth pattern um, and BCL2 or BCL6 rearrangements are seen and or the lack of IRF4 in equivocal cases. Okay. Uh, so then we can move to large B cell lymphomas. Um, so the, the WHO recognizes 17 separate large B cell lymphoma entities. I'm only going to touch on a few. Um, many of them have been unchanged from the prior edition, but I felt that these were the ones that would be most um, of interest to um, a pathologist looking at day-to-day -day, um, lymphoma samples. So changes were made to the following entities from the fourth edition. So high-grade B-cell lymphoma with MYC and BCL2 and or BCL6. Um, so that is now, uh, it, it's now a new entity. Um, Burkitt-like lymphoma with 11Q aberration is also a new entity. And B-cell lymphoma unclassifiable with features intermediate between DLBCL and classic Hodgkin lymphoma is a new entity. So um, in terms of high-grade B-cell lymphomas with gene rearrangements, um, so the, w, the fourth edition of the WHO, as we all know, had a high-grade B-cell lymphoma with MYC and BCL2 and or BCL6, um, as well as high-grade B-cell lymphoma NOS. And uh, now that's been changed. So tumors that have MYC and BCL2 rearrangements are uh, now named either diffuse large B-cell lymphoma with MYC and BCL2 or high-grade B-cell lymphoma with MYC and BCL2. And um, the uh, WHO uh, stated that uh, they still value the morphology for these entities because it's thought that um, there may be slight um, survival differences based on the morphologic um, uh, based on the morphologic findings in, in the lymphoma. Um, obviously this is subjective. So I'm, um, it, it, I, I, this would be something that would be interesting to discuss among the community um, to see what, what people thought about that. Um, uh, but basically that's what the WHO um, has, uh, has uh, stated. So these entities with um, either, uh, with MYC and BCL2 arrangements usually show morphology that ranges from last large cells in DLBCL to sort of blastoid or intermediate cells that are seen in high grade. Um, fish break apart probes, probes are recommended for diagnosis. And Adam, you might have to chime in here. <laughs> so the WHO stated that it might, that break aparts might miss the rearrangements in up to 20% of cases, but it would be interesting to see what your, um, what your experience has been. And the entity shows a gene expression profile that's close to centroblasts of the germinal center dark zone. And it actually has a mutational signature that's more uh, similar to follicular lymphoma than to DLBCL NOS. So it is a, diff it's a, it's a, it is its own entity. Sorry, I don't know why it's going, not going forward. It seems to have frozen. Oh, sorry. Okay, um, so in terms of the essential criteria, so the morphology and the phenotype is consistent with aggressive B-cell lymphoma, and um, there has to be evidence of concurrent MYC and BCL2 arrangements, and it may or, it may, or may not have BCL6 rearrangements. Uh, in terms of des uh, desirable criteria, um, it's interesting, uh, so GCB phenotype, 
um, is considered desirable. And in fact, the WHO and the ICC both uh, suggest that um, pathologists continue to perform um, cell of origin IHC in order to um, help determine whether or not uh, lymphomas are GCB versus non-GCB, even though the gold standard is uh, gene expression profiling. Um, in addition, TDT protein expression status is, is, uh, is desirable. And um, this is because in the fourth edition of the WHO, um, it was thought that uh, large B-cell lymphomas with TDT expression um, should be classified as, um, as, uh, uh, B, uh, as basically like an immature B-cell um, neoplasm. Um, so, uh, but, but now that criteria has changed. And so without the expression of CD34 by flow and uh, with the, um, uh, and, and basically by demonstrating that it is a mature B-cell neoplasm um, with TDT protein expression status, uh, it can be reclassified as either DLBCL or high-grade um, uh, B-cell lymphoma with TDT expression. And then the other thing that is desirable is the determination of the MIC fusion partner as that is thought to have an impact on prognosis of the, this entity. Um, so, in, so, that, so that's for the WHO. The ICC um, continues to call this uh, high-grade B-cell lymphoma with MIC and BCL2 rearrangements with or without BCL6. Okay, and so I just wanted to contrast this with high-grade B-cell lymphoma NOS. So, um, so basically this is considered a very heterogeneous category of aggressive uh, mature B-cell lymphomas, and they're composed uh, of medium sized or blastoid cells, and they, they basically don't fit to any other of the defined categories of lymphomas in the WHO. Um, these can have isolated MIC rearrangements, and in fact, quite, quite a number of them do. Um, and some of them have been reported to have MIC amplifications. Translocations of BCL2 and BCL6 are reported, obviously not at the same time as the MIC, um, because then that would move it into the other category. Um, so sequencing data suggests that most of the commonly mutated genes are not um, similar to uh, high, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma slash high-grade B-cell lymphoma with MIC and BCL2 um, because the most commonly mutated genes aren't actually um, related to follicular lymphoma, but are more um, uh, involve more of uh, TP53 mutations or KMT2D. And it suggests that these are actually um, separate entities and that even, um, and they think that there's actually several different gene expression signatures even within this, en this, this entity and that there are seven different, several different biological subgroups um, if the mutational spectrum is uh, examined. Uh, so in terms of the essential criteria, so it's a similar cytomorphology to uh, high-grade B-cell lymphoma, um, not consistent with either DLBCL or Burkitt, lack of TDT and CD34 expression in order to exclude lymphoblastic lymphoma, and lack of cyclin D1 to exclude mantle cell. Um, as I mentioned before, absence of MYC and BCL2, and absence of um, 11Q abnormalities, as that would put it into a new category, as I'll explain later. Um, so desirable would be a gene expression signature, as well as KMT2D and TP53 mutation. So yeah, so this is something that um, is of interest to me, and I'd like to I'd like to gauge the group's uh, thoughts on this. Um, of note, uh, among uh, high grade B cell lymphoma NOS with a MYC mutation, um, differentiation of so this 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 I thought would be an important point. So differentiation from Burkitt lymphoma. Um, may be supported by mutation analyses. So these aren't actually in the desirable uh, or essential criteria, but I think it's of note. Um, so, so genes that are often found um, in uh, Burkitt lymphoma, such as, um, or mutations in genes that are often found in Burkitt lymphoma, such as ID3, TCF3, um, cyclin D3, SMARC A4, uh, are not found in, in uh, high-grade B-cell lymphoma, and uh, it might be something of interest um, in the future. Uh, so this 
So this entity is a new one, um, and it's basically re renaming Burkitt lymphoma um, with uh, 11Q abnormalities. So, so this was called Burkitt lymphoma in the fourth edition, mainly because of its morphological, um, mainly because of its morphology. And so um, it's, uh, but what they found after um, molecular analyses is that um, the, the mutational spectrum is actually more similar to DLBCL than to Burkitt. And so that's why it's considered a different entity now. Um, and so uh, in terms of the 11Q aberrations, it, it's usually a complex aberration that invo involves a long arm of chromosome 11, and that it involves a minimal gain in 11Q23 with a loss at the um, uh, towards the terminal portion of 11Q uh, without the presence of a MIC translocation. Um, the presence of the gain is less specific for this entity than the telomeric loss or LOH at the terminal portion of 11Q. Sorry, I'm not sure. Okay, there we go. Um, so in terms of what's essential, um, so basically uh, you'd like to see a lymphoma that has Burkitt-like morphology and a typical immunophenotype. So BCL6 positive, BCL2 negative, CD10 positive. Um, and then, so then this actually requires that you do chromosome 11Q analysis, um, as well as the exclusion of a, of a MIC translocation. So I'm not sure how many of us are doing 11Q analysis on our um, uh, Burkitt lymphomas, but that's you know that's part a part of why we're presenting this. So just wanted to bring it up for discussion. Uh, and what's desirable is the expression of CD56 in the absence of CD30, of a high expression of CD38. Okay. Um, so this is kind of giving you an idea of um, how the uh, new classification or the hierarchy of um, what one would do and how one would diagnose these different entities. Um, what I noticed though is that they don't seem to have high-grade B-cell lymphoma with MIC rearrangement and lack of other um, uh, lack of other rearrangements. So, so that's something uh, unless it's unless it's merging with this. But um, anyway, so that's that's something that we uh, we can look at. So, so basically, if you have MIC uh, rearranged and then you also have um, BCL two and BCL uh, six rearranged, um, or just uh, BCL2 rearranged, you, you put it into this new category, um, and then, uh, and, and so on. And then obviously an 11Q gain or loss um, uh, puts it into this new category of uh, high-grade B-cell lymphoma with 11Q aberrations. Um, okay, does anyone have any questions? Just gonna, I'm just gonna run through this because we're. I see that we're kind of getting close to our time. <sighs> Sorry. Okay. Um, and then uh, one of the final large B cell lymphomas that's changed is um, this new entity known as mediastinal gray zone lymphoma. So that this used to be B cell lymphoma unclassifiable with features intermediate between DLBCL and classical Hodgkin lymphoma. And this often shows overlapping features with primary mediastinal lymphoma and nodular sclerosing Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, but this, uh, based off of molecular studies and gene expression profiling, um, the WHO authors did feel that this was its own entity. And um, because it shows intermediate biological features between the two, it's part of the spectrum. And, um, and, and that's why they've given it this, this, uh, this moniker of gray zone lymphoma in the mediastinum. Um, so in terms of essential criteria, so there's two patterns that one can see. So there's um, uh, classical Hodgkin-like, and here you can see that there's uh, growth of these pleomorphic large cells. And then, you know, sorry, and, and you, you can't really appreciate it here, but there's like rare eosinophils and then, and scattered lymphocytes. So you can often see a mixed inflammatory background together with these sort of lacunar cells that resemble Hodgkin cells. 
Um, however, what's different is that you, it here's CD20 and it's it's a sheet like um, and very strong expression of uh, B cell markers and here's CD79A. So unlike Hodgkin lymphoma, you're seeing very strong expression of B cell markers and that's what puts this into mediastinal basal lymphoma. Um, so what they suggest is that you have uniform strong expression of CD20 and PAX5, as well as uniform and strong expression of at least one additional B cell marker. And then the CD30 can be, it has to be positive, but be of varying intensity. So that's in contrast to the primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma like version of this entity. And so here you have monomorphic sheets of large cells. Some of them are quite aberrant. Some of them may, um, some of them may look like Reed Sternberg cells, but mainly you could use it's it's basically sheets of large cells with less of that mixed inflammatory background in the back, um, as well as uh, fibrotic stroma. And then here's CD30 in the background. You can see that it's sheet-like expression, very strong, as well as CD15. And so that's part of the essential criteria. So strong CD30 with uniform expression and partial or complete loss of B cell markers, or strong. Ugh, sorry, or strong CD15 expression. And then, um, so for this diagnosis, it's best not to do it on small biopsies because you do need to see um, the, the topography of this, of this lymphoma um, and, then all, and then absence of EBV. And so this kind of gives you, oh, so, then, so then that basically concludes our, the changes in the large cell lymphoma. I just wanted to touch on this, um, uh, this new classification of um, immunodeficiency and um, deregulated um, lymphoproliferative disorders. So, um, so this is a bit complicated. You can go to the original um, uh, WHO um, manuscripts to, to kind of parse all of this out. But basically, um, but, uh, sorry, but basically um, here, uh, I just wanted to touch on it because in the past, we would diagnose something as, you know, um, PTLD or iatrogenic um, LPD. But here, what they suggest is actually it should be a multi-part um, diagnosis where you give the histologic diagnosis, including the morphology of what you're seeing, the viral association, as well as the immune deficiency setting, and in order to give uh, the clinical team a better idea of exactly what they're um, what they're facing. And so. Um, Sorry, I'm just trying to be very conscious of time. Uh, yeah, so that's so, a, oops. Uh, so yeah, um, uh, so I just wanted to touch on this because this is a change from the prior WHO classification. Um, so yeah, so that's basically it. Uh, so in terms of our summary and discussion points, so there are some differences between the fifth edition of the WHO as well as the ICC classification. I'm curious to know how everyone's dealing with this. Are we reporting out one or the other or both classifications? Are we just saying, forget it, and just like reverting back to the uh, fourth edition of the WHO um, and, and kind of letting the clinical team deal with uh, any ancillary testing? Um, and then the other thing I wanted to discuss was that so... As, as we see in the WHO criteria um, with regard to um, these essential and de de desirable criteria that they put forth for each entity, um, there's incorporation of some molecular and cytogenetic testing as it's relevant to the diagnosis and prognosis of each entity. Um, they, and, and obviously they did this just, you know, keeping in mind that not all labs have access to this or have been doing this regularly. And so is this something that, we should plan for in the future. There are also other sort of research assays. Um, I didn't get into the fact that diffuse large visa lymphoma has about 150 genes that are all part of these different panels in which they're, um, you know, creating these subsets of B cell, uh, diffuse large B cell lymphomas. Um, right now, there isn't an overarching genetic scheme in order to actually determine what these different entities are, or so, it, or that is exact, that's what the WHO is proposing. And so that's why they didn't put it in the actual, um, in the actual classification system. But is this something that we should be looking forward to in the future and something that we should be preparing for? So yeah, so these are some questions that I thought that we could talk about. And uh, yeah, but obviously that's all, all with regard to time, so. Thanks Rashmi, that was great. Um, I'm gonna open the chat here. We had some comments, so uh, 
we'll see we'll see what people say uh, so i don't know if you want to speak specifically about any of the molecular commentary um or if you want to if you want to go through some of these questions first and see uh, some of them are molecular anyways i think there is some dis dis discussion about the burkett like 11q abnormalities and how to actually detect them um i think it's a challenge because as you say the the minimal critical region is potentially variable and we don't you know I, i'm not sure that testing with fish is a really really safe way to go um I actually kind of feel the same thing about the follicular lymphoma with the 1P36 abnormalities as well. And we did some fish for those for a while and they were kind of all over the place as well. So I'm not, not sure that's, <laughs> not sure that, that either of those solutions are, 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 you know, sort of top shelf as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I think, I mean, array seems to be overkill and you'd need to have a, you need to have an algorithm, you know, and I still think, Considering the the number of negative, like Nick negative cases, I don't know how many, but I guess it would only be in cases with suspected burkets, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be like large cell lymphoma as a whole. So it, it's going to be a pretty small. So I guess, you know, probably we could build like an MLPA assay or something like that that would allow us to, to do 11Q copy number maybe a little bit more um, effectively or, or cost effectively. Um, so that that was that was sort of one of the comments that I had. I don't know what you what you feel about that, Rashmi. Yeah, I mean, I think that like the the papers that were showing that one uh, one p abnormality in follicular, like in diffuse follicular, um, they, like they were very small case studies. So I'm I'm not sure. Like now that it's actually been defined as an entity, who knows? Maybe they'll they'll see that that's actually not like that that abnormality is not definitive. Well, I, I think it might be similar to the. And Q abnormality that there's regions that are gained and lost and they're not like you know if you were to pick one probe like I remember we were working on this a little bit with with Rumina and we had a whole system. I think we had about a dozen or so of these cases and we fished them I think with one or two probes we, we had a custom probe and one that was very close to the P terminal and we were getting like different results depending on which probe we used on the same sample <laughs> so we kind of, okay, well, you have, to, you have to pick the probe very, very carefully. And then, you know, like I think, so I think my comment there was, I think if we're going to call this thing an entity and say it's associated with a very specific biomarker change, like a loss of 1P, I think we need to very clearly define where the start of that region is and where the end of that region is and like, you know, how we're going to interpret it. Otherwise, you know, anytime you have polyploidy or you know some kind of like weird you know we get all sorts of weird karyotypic things happening with mm -hmm. lymphoma so like how often does that contribute potentially to you know um, potentially confounding the diagnosis so i think there's definitely work to do uh, on the one piece mm -hmm. no okay. i agree well and the other thing is is that like i mean it's not like that they're it's not like they're putting forth a lot of molecular testing in the who um but you know there are certain and like there are certain entities for which something that's considered desirable may actually be needed like cxcr4 in lpl um but you know, but you know there's some things that like i don't know that a lot of people are doing like when i was in training for example i think we were doing karyotyping on all the lymphoid neoplasms but i don't know how common that is in all labs, right? So, you know, looking for complex karyotype in CLL, like, is like, like, are we going to be regularly doing this, you know, so? Well, I, I don't, I mean, I don't think so. I, I think, in fact, I think fish is going to disappear from CLL as well, for, at least in, in Canadian labs. Um, you know, because uh, one of the one of the things that's happening is, is we're we're looking at more mutational markers in uh, CLL. I think there's some pressure to try to consolidate, and so I, certainly uh, some labs have, have launched a combined NGS, you know, copy number and mutational panel, which is potentially one way to go. Does not address the complex karyotype issue, mm -hmm. and you know I think I think if we're going to go down that road, I think OGM makes a lot more sense than yeah. than than say karyotype because um, you know 
pretty much everywhere that I've worked, the consensus has always been, oh yeah, we stopped karyotyping lymphoma because it's just too much work. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I think from a workload perspective, it's going to be, and, and, you know, the karyotype is, is, is problematic because, you know, you see a bunch of changes and you go, hmm, yeah, there's some changes there. I don't know what they are, but there's some changes there. Isn't that nice? So basically the only thing you're getting from your karyotype is, is it complex, <laughs> right? Um, and, you know, if you, if you see anything, if it's recurrent, you need to fish it or you need to do something else. Or you need to have some other kind of, of you know, panel that, that is going to detect those things. So I think that becomes problematic, which is why I think OGM is, is really sort of interesting um, um, possibility. And just to give a, a really brief example, we had a, a TALL come into the lab and we have no probes for TALL because it's relatively rare in North America. So we saw, I think it was a translocation 611 and I go, oh, 11, well, you know, you know, might be Nuke 98 because Nuke 98 is on 11P and it was an 11P translocation. And, you know, okay, great. We just happened to run OGM on it the next week and it turned out it was LMO2 and not Nuke 98. So, you know, I think the interesting part is that is if we get some of these, you know, get access to more of these samples and we can do better high profiling, uh, genome profiling with something like OGM, we'll, we'll actually see, um, you know, the, the, the possibility of really molecularly resolving a lot of these cases more efficiently. Mm -hmm. And in CLL, I, I was just gonna say just one final point about CLL is that if the frontline treatment, basically if you have high risk CLL is gonna be a brute nib, and if you don't have high risk CLL is gonna be um, chemoimmunotherapy. And if you fail chemoimmunotherapy within, you know, six months or a year and you go to a brute nib, like does the karyotype really matter? And then maybe it's more important in the relapse refractory setting where we have a bunch of different therapies to decide on. But I think I think that's a conversation, you know, that we need to have with, you know, a larger group of stakeholders potentially. Mm -hmm. I had a question about OGM. So then um, I guess you, like, what would be the process when you have a lymphoma sample that comes in? Like, do you, do you disaggregate tissue, fresh tissue for that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, I mean, I think that's the way to go if we can do that. Um, I, I, I mean, I think, you know, as we move out of the liquid tumors, like into, into the more solid tumor applications, um, you, you know, in getting fresh tissue, whether it be like a cytological sample or whether it be, um, you know, a needle biopsy or something that we can, we can get a, at least some or one biopsy that we can, we can disaggregate and, and extract DNA from. I think that that's one of the potential ways forward. We haven't gone down that road yet because I think there's, you know, there's still sort of lots to do in terms of uh, <laughs> the validation that it goes into a whole, that whole piece, right? And changing practice as well. So getting people to actually collect that sample for us. So, but it's possible. And I think I actually thought for diffuse large B cell lymphoma, it would solve like a whole ton of problems, right? Because it's like, oh, knowing the MIC partner is desirable. And mm -hmm. I sent you, the, I sent you the Mayo Clinic algorithm. I think I don't know if you saw it yeah. for their DLBC algorithm, and it's just like it's, you know, I mean, it's it's like the metro system in in London. It, it's there's so many lines, it's complicated and. You know, the funny part, I think, you know, is if we could put OGM at the top of the list there, we, we just, it, like, it's like just one, it's just like, you know, like the LBCL query, OGM answer, you know, do you have mm -hmm. Mick? Yeah. Who's the partner? We know the partner. Yeah, so you could solve a lot of problems. So, but, you know, that's somewhere down the line in terms of, you know, a future state. Um Okay. Any other any other questions? I can't see everybody's everybody's hand on my screen. So if you if you do have your hand up, um, I'm not calling on you. Please please speak out. Don't be shy. Uh, I see um, Ali also had a question in the chat about KMT two A. Um, KMT is KMT two A located at, at eleven Q two three, and can it be used as a surrogate for the eleven Q two three amplification in Burkitt's cases? I I actually think. Both both KMT2A and ATM are sort of in this this region where they can either be gained or lost, um, and I, I don't think we have anything in the lab. I'm just gonna that I, that we use at least that's more distal that would give us a better read. I think what Rashmi, what you said is that the the more distal loss is the more frequent 
-hmm. there's a more more, it's more sort specific. Of specific yeah so we don't have anything that's that distal that we can use so that i mean again if you know the case were and i think probably the best thing to do would have be develop some kind of multicolor custom probe where we have like maybe 11 centromere or something around you know atm kmt2a and then something more distal and we get a read of like three regions at the time so um anyways okay well, lots of questions coming in sorry i'm going to try to get to them uh at uha we do mick fish on all so right so uh rosemary's got a comment here about us doing uh reflex testing sorry which is a, a reply to shuju um and let's see here or algorithm so Sadaf has written for the HGBCL DLBCL algorithm is sent for reflex B cell panel and then get it tested further. We may miss the chromosome 11 Q gain loss at Perkett like neutrology. And that shall we check all the boxes, including chromosome 11 valuation? I mean, I guess, I guess that's a good question. The question really is does anybody actually have it running and validated? Is anybody running that assay in Ontario? And I don't, I don't know if anybody is doing it. Um, not by fish anyways, it may be by other applications. I don't know if anybody on the call has experience with that. They can comment about it. No, no comments. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that's certainly an area that we're, um, that we're, you know, we have to think about how to develop. I think both that and the MIC IG partner, uh, you know, or the MIC partner gene when the, in the DLBCL is, is sort of areas that we're not addressing in the labs right now. Um, and certainly testing for MIC IGH isn't that challenging, but I, I know that I think the MIC IGK and the MIC IGL testing by fish is, is more challenging. And then, of course, it's just a balloon of like, okay, so you know, we're going to, we, we, we just try, we just implemented this reflex testing strategy at UHN. And I know a, a lot of other places are now doing it as well um, for MIC testing to sort of try to contain the costs, right? <laughs> and and now, now we're going to go like, okay, well, let's add MIC IGH to every, you know, MIC positive. And then if yeah. it's not positive, then MIC IGL and then 11Q. And then, you know, like, so there's a lot of, I, so I think it's, we have to think very carefully about how we're going to uh, implement that kind of testing, because it, it, there are definite cost implications and workload implications for any of those changes. Mm -hmm. No, definitely. Um, I think I saw a question from Sadaf. It says, how can we tell the difference between follicular lymphoma that has transformed to DLBCL versus follicular-like large B-cell lymphoma? Are these entities interchangeable? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a great question. Um, and, and it just goes to show like this, this it's quite it's quite subjective and it's really a spectrum because like I mean, you know, here I'm showing you like, you know, obviously one thing with like with uh, with the one entity. But you know, if you've got some if you've got like a, a sample and it's got areas that look like follicular large B cell lymphoma and then other areas where it's lost CD21 or CD23, then the question is it like, is it do you call this diffuse large B cell lymphoma um, or like using the new entity like transformed from follicular lymphoma? Um, and then, and then, uh, and uh, if you have, if you just have a small sample, then it's also hard to tell. Um, it's, yeah, I don't have a, I don't have an easy answer to that. <laughs> I think you just have to take it on a case by case basis. Um, you know, look at the clinical history, look at, like, look at what the, um, uh, look at exactly what's in your sample. I don't know if that answers your question, but um, yeah, I, I don't know that they are interchangeable per se, but it, they can be hard to tease out. Yeah. Um, and I see that Alexandra Poliga also has two comments here, Rashmi, which I'll, I'll just, I'll just read them out quickly and then you can you can maybe comment. So she says, I find HGBNOS very challenging. One case had a young man with metastinal mass, had in my opinion, blastic morphology, TDD negative and CMIC translocation. Um, 
BCL2, BCL6 negative. So I invoked HGB and OS, uh, but then sent the case out and they called it DLBCL. Patient ended up being refractory therapy. So I personally do think it was a true high grade B cell NOS dark zone. Um, yeah. uh, and, and I guess, you know, part of the question there too is, you know, like, um, you know, are we, are we molecularly uh, characterizing these patients sufficiently to give them, you know, to make, to make the distinction between them? I think probably, you know, the, the, the better we can characterize them, that might maybe make that distinction easier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it just goes, it just, and I, I see that there's like another, there's another comment on it. It shows yeah. how subjective it is. And it is like, I think it's very subjective. Like, I think it's, I mean, like, I find it interesting that they say that, you know, if you have, like, even when you can molecularly characterize the entity, like this is a lymphoma with both MYC and BCL2, and it, you know, has either like large or intermediate grade morpho, like in intermediate sized cells, blastoid cells, like, they're asking you to make a molecular call, like a morphologic call on that. And I think that, I, I don't know, it's, it's a very subjective call. I don't know that, like, I, I don't know that if you gave the same sample to five different pathologists, you would get the same call, you know, even though it, it's both MIC and BCL2 rearranged. So like, and then, and then, then, then that calls into question that if there are quote morphologic differences that lead to, um, you know, different outcomes, then what exactly are we seeing? Like, why, why is that, right? Like, is there some other molecular mechanism that, that we can help tease that apart? You know, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I'm sure that's, that we'll have to wait for the next version. <laughs> 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 Probably. <laughs> uh, and then uh, there was one final question, I think here. How are you dealing with this rare cases of follicular lymphoma grade 3A present with a completely diffuse pattern? In the WHO uh, fourth edition, such cases were designated as DLBCL. Currently is uncertain whether such should be classified as FL or DLBCL. Yeah. Um... I, I, I haven't come across anything like that myself, but I, like, I, I'd open it up to the, to the floor to see what other people, other people have been reporting it as. Any comments from anybody? Please speak up. Don't worry about raising your hand. We're, <laughs> we're, we're all friends. <laughs> yeah. This is meant to be open discussion. So, uh, this is Sadaf. I have a question. Actually. So, um, how should we, you know, put it in our diagnosis with all these lots of uh, categories now? We have for follicular lymphoma, whether this is follicular lymphoma with diffuse row pattern, follicular light -like cell lymphoma, or follicular lymphoma that has transformed to um, um, DLBCL. So, how do you report it, or how others are you know, coping up with this new terminology? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's, and that's partly like why I kind of wanted to bring this up to the group is just to see how everyone else is doing it. Because I think that, you know, I mean, like, I mean, I've been partial to the WHO, <laughs> but I think that's just because I've been used to using the WHO, like the fourth edition. So, um. Yeah, but I mean, like there, yeah, there's this, the, there's the ICC classification to take into account as well. So, I mean, I, I, it's, I, I kind of, it, it's been more haphazard on my part, but I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see what, how everyone else is dealing with it. And feel free to put it in the chat window if you don't want to speak up. Even currently when I'm using, I'm using the WHO5 and it's easy to put it up like it's follicular lymphoma grade one to two or if it's 3A or I mean, it's good that they've eliminated the central blast count, which was more yeah. tricky when it has inter-observer and intra-observer variability. Yeah. And um, so that was just the easy part that was to, you know, um, in, in the new classification, 
but uh, still if it's transformed, if it's not based on patient's previous history of little lymphoma, if you're talking about like that, but you need the complete node to evaluate. Exactly, evaluate. yeah. Yeah, no, and, and you've touched on a very important point, which is that if you're like, I mean, I don't know how many people get like complete nodes nowadays. It's usually just like slivers of small, small lymph node tissue. So, I mean, um, it's, uh, and a lot of these diagnoses are hard to do when you don't, when you're like, when you're presented with limited materials. So um, I, I think that sometimes putting even a differential diagnosis down is, is, can, can it help, you know, um, kind of help explain to clinicians like where, where uh, things might be falling through the cracks. I see Alexandra has her hand up. I, <laughs> so yeah, I happen to have been really unlucky and I had like a series of three or four cases like this where I had, um, they were, uh, they were excisionals and where you had follicular 3A obvious areas. And then in some areas, the CD21 like drops out and you're getting a more diffuse sort of proliferation um, with BCL6 positive cells. And the KI is, you know, borderline like 40%. And you go down and you start looking at the diffuse areas and yeah, there's like scattered centroplasts, but there's definitely still centrocytes mixed in there. And so, you know, it, it is morphologically different than a DLBCL that is just sheets of large cells. And previously, if you got up to a count of 15 centroblasts in a high power field in a diffuse area like that, you could invoke the LBCL. Um, and now they say it's uncertain. And, and I understand why, um, well, I actually went in and looked at the paper that they referenced, which was not, um super <laughs> helpful um, it was a little disturbing because they only had like it was a report like they had a study from 2016 that they quoted and there's only like four cases in it that had this pattern and all patients apparently in europe all follicular lymphoma patients are treated with rtop or at least in this study everyone was treated with rtop and the the follicular three a's with the diffuse pattern did as well as the follicular one twos. So based on that, they're like, well, maybe it's not, you know, we shouldn't be calling these DLBCLs. And I, and I don't know how many cycles of RTOP or exactly what their chemo was, but their comment was just that these patients, this cohort was treated with RTOP. And mm. so, and that was back in 2016. And, and that study concluded, we should look into this diffuse pattern of follicular 3A and C, like, is it actually as bad as a true bona fide DLBCL? Should it be getting the same treatment? And I don't know what they've done since then, but like that was the only reference they had in the WHO for that statement. So thought that was funny, but biologically I, I could see it being different and maybe, and now here, like in our institution for 3A, patients get frentuximab, I believe, or uh, bendamustine, I'm not sure, but they don't get our job. Um, so there is a treatment difference. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, like referencing a really small case series like that is kind of dangerous. <laughs> um, uh, but I think it probably warrants, like, it, it does warrant further studies into it. It doesn't help you with the case per se, um, but yeah. I mean, what have you been, so have you been, have you been telling the clinicians that like in the past, this would have been considered? Yeah, and so all these patients had low LDHs, low stage disease. So the, the first three were older, they were like in their eighties. So the, the clinicians were happy not to treat aggressively and just watch and wait. Um, but then one patient was 26 recently. And so that one I've sent to NIH just to see what they say. <laughs> uh, Is that then, pending? Yeah, <laughs> I haven't heard back. <laughs> I'm waiting for that one. Okay, uh, I'll just see a comment from Ali, and then I think, in the interest of time, we'll probably move on because we have case presentations, so we don't want to delay too much. Um, 
let's see, Ali's comment in the chat is biologically if like lymphoma 3A, even if diffuse behaves more like low grade FL than de novo DLVCL. If central blasts do not stay in blast phase all the time and become centrocytes, biologically they cannot be considered DLBCL. So there's no other comments on that. Um, we can we can move on. We have a uh, case presentation by uh, Dr. Alexandra Paliga, and uh, a brief introduction is. Uh, so she did her uh, Bachelor of Science Biochemistry at the University of Ottawa, followed by medical training at McGill University and residency in anatomic pathology uh, back at the University of Ottawa, uh, which was followed by a hematopathology fellowship in Portland, Oregon, Oregon. And now she currently works at Ottawa Hospital and she's the subspecialty lead for lymphoma uh, and all signs of some gyne pathology as well. Uh, and so it's my to introduce Alexandra for her case presentation. Thank you. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, I'm just going to set this up into present mode. And can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. So this was a, a challenging case I recently had. Um, it was a 74, the patient was a 74 year old male and he had an LDH of 184. And on subsequent CT scan, he had uh, disease in more than one site. And um, this is a sort of, it was an excisional biopsy and essentially the lymph node was effaced by these funny follicles that um, had numerous cells in them um, that you could identify centroblasts easily, but there were also cells that looked more like immunoblasts. And then there were T cells mixed in the background. And um, so we had centroblasts, we had immunoblasts, um, and then we had T cells. Um, and then, and so this is just another high power view. Some areas, it was really difficult to identify convincing centroblasts, but immunoblasts were easily identified and seemed to be the predominant cell. And there were occasional mitotic figures. CD20 was positive. KI67 showed a surprisingly low proliferation rate uh, compared to the normal germinal center on the control slide. So I thought that was a little odd. CD20 was negative, but BCL6 was positive. MUM1 was negative uh, and BCL2 was positive. CMIC was positive. And so the summary was that this was a CD10 negative um, follicular lymphoma that was negative for MUM1, but BCL2 positive. It had a surprisingly low KI67. CMIC was positive and EBV was negative. And the case was sent for translocation testing and the results came back as CMIC and BCL2 positive and BCL6 was negative. So what do we call this lymphoma? And there was supposed to be like a quiz option. Okay, very interesting. Um, yeah, so at our consensus rounds, we were sort of all over the map as well. And so this led to, uh, you know, going to look at the new classification systems more closely. And so first uh, I started with the WHO um, and we just reviewed um, the new follicular lymphoma. So I won't talk too much about it, but essentially there's classic follicular lymphoma, which is grades one, two, and three A lumped together. And the WHO provides this helpful picture about of what a grade one, two should look like and what a 3A should look like in the middle. So the middle picture is supposed to be the 3A with still some centrocytes in the back. And then um, the WHO calls the former 3B a large um, follicular B cell lymphoma. And that one's supposed to have all just central blasts. Um, and classic follicular lymphoma should be BCL2 positive. And the KI67 can be variable 
um, but it's usually much lower than a reactive follicle. And additionally, well, we already talked about this. Um, so then the large follicular large B cell lymphoma, um, which has already also been mentioned today, it's uh, close, very close biologically to DLBCL and the centroblasts should be in sheets and there should be no centrocytes in the background. Um, they note that BCL2 translocation is uncommon in these entities. And, um, and if you're considering this diagnosis, you should look at um, order rearrangement testing, which is what we did. And if MUM1 is strongly expressed, you should additionally consider IRF4 fish analysis. And so our case, um, we were, uh, most of us were favoring putting it as a 3B based on the morphology. However, it wasn't, you know, the, the presence of the immunoblasts was odd. Uh, the BCL2 translocation was odd and the KI67 being so low was odd. So uh, that prompted a closer look at this uh, follicular lymphoma with unusual cytomorphologic features uh, category. And so in the actual WHO, like the version online, um, they say that this category consists of medium-sized cells with immature or blastoid chromatin or large cells with cleaved irregular nuclei, so-called large centrocytes. Um, and then they just talk about how they're, you know, we don't know much about them. They usually have a high KI and usually they're MUM1 positive. Um, and then they usually don't have BCL2 rearrangement, though they can have them. And data is unavailable on how these do. And so then I dived into the references that um, they use for this category. Um, and this paper came up um, about high grade follicular lymphomas that essentially don't fit well into either 3A or 3B. And specifically in this paper, they talked about, um, they had this case that, um, which was D, which um, they said it had, uh, the cells in there had central nucleoli. Um, and um, they also considered that as a morphology that was unusual with immunoblasts, um, which, you know, the picture was fuzzy, but I thought it was somewhat similar to my picture. Um, and that particular case did have um, a translocation with both MYC and BCL2, um, which is why they included it in their, um, in their series. Uh, they didn't feel that the cells were morphologically central blasts. Uh, and, and then this had this translocation. And, um, and then they have that comment about how these cases usually have a higher KI-67, but when you look at their uh, range, their cases ranged from 15 to 100%. Um, and then for MUM1 expression, they said it was usually higher, but the range was one to 70%, and the mean was 30%. Um, but essentially lumping all these different cases together into this FLU category catch bag, uh, they were able to show that with uh, in RTOP treated patients, the FL3U cases did worse um, than the 1-2 cases. Uh, meanwhile, the 3A cases did the same as the 1-2 cases. And so therefore inferring that these difficult to classify um, follicular lymphomas um, do worse um, on average than the one, two. Um, they also referenced this paper um, in that category of follicular lymphomas with large cleaved cells. Um, and this is a category that is nicely described in this paper from Human Pathology in 2018. And they sort of brought up this cat, this paper and these large cleaved cells, um, saying that you know poor pathologists like 
that there's no home for these cases in the fourth uh, edition of the WHO. And um, because, you know, pathologists have difficulty saying whether or not these large centrocytes are indeed centrocytes or are they centroblasts? Because they're typically large sized cleaved cells and they'll have abundant pale cytoplasm um, with more dispersed chromatin. And, um, and they're similar to size of a centroblast. So by flow, they will be large. Um, and these cases often show up with fibrosis and they often have a higher KI-67 than a typical follicular lymphoma 1, 2, or 3A. So the authors worry that people would be more likely to call these a 3B, um, but they feel they did a study um, and essentially these cases have similar survival to um, the other uh, follicular lymphomas, 1, 2, and 3A. So these large centrocyte cleaved follicular lymphomas are different, and they want them to be identified separately from um, the other follicular lymphomas, and they don't want them to, they, they feel that they shouldn't be lumped in with, uh, yeah, uh, either uh, classic follicular or large follicular lymphomas. Um, and then they just note that, um, yeah, on their mean proliferation index was 50%. Um, most of them are otherwise very similar to other follicular lymphomas in that they do have uh, BCL2 translocations. Um, so yeah, so that, that's the who, and that's why they, we, those were the sort of their main references for this category of um, unusual features, or un and then here in this paper, they called them unclassifiable follicular lymphomas. Um, and so what does the ICC say? Um, so the ICC doesn't have large cleaved uh, follicular lymphoma, and it doesn't have the unclassifiable follicular lymphoma. Instead, um, they sort of address ambiguous morphology uh, so they say if you have a case that has uh, follicular lymphoma kind of 3A features versus 3B, and you're not sure which it is for whatever reason, uh, they recommend doing BCL2 and CD10. Um, and if those are positive, then um, more then you should be favoring follicular lymphoma 3A. But if um, those are negative, um, then you should consider 3B. Um, and these will usually have a BCL6 rearrangement and a MIC rearrangement rather than the BCL2 rearrangement. Um, while the follicular 3As will more likely have the BCL2 rearrangement. Um, and then of course, if MUM1 is positive, consider IRF4 fish. So comparing, uh, going back to this case, um, so the case I had, you know, wasn't a perfect fit, I didn't feel for any category, um, but at the end of the day, um, I decided to call it a uh, variable, uh, to put it in the FLU category based on the fact that the morphology wasn't, you know, uh, definite all centroblasts um, and that it didn't have a BCL6 rearrangement, but a BCL2 rearrangement. Um, though the, the low KI was weird um, and the MUM1 um, and, and it did have double hit pathogenesis. So essentially I, I threw it back at the clinicians <laughs> and, and just told them that this is what I have. So that's, that's it. And I'll take a look at the chat. Oh, um, the CD21 was really strong. Like it, it was very well defined follicles. I didn't show it, but um, they weren't uh, loose or whatever. They were very intense. <laughs> 
Okay. Um, thanks very much, Alexander. That was great. I think uh, we all, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we we all wait these these new classifications to help solve these problems, and what we often get is more problems. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, anyways, in the interest of time, I think uh, I want to move on. If, if there's any questions uh, and we have time at the end, we can we can maybe have a little chat. Uh, but I want to move on to Sarah Morgan's case to make sure she has sufficient time to present. So. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Sarah Morgan, who's a hematopathologist and surgical pathologist at Oak Valley Health at the Markham Stovall Hospital site. She's also an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. And she did her training at the University of Toronto and the Hematopathology Fellowship at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Centre. And it is our pleasure to have her uh, participate in a community of interest today. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Adam. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Um, so I'm going to change gears and talk about something slightly different. Um, I'm going to present two cases with interesting findings that we might come across uh, in day-to-day -day cases. So my first case is um, a 74-year-old male patient who came to our hospital with shortness of breath uh, on exertion, and the past medical history was really um, not relevant except for hypertension. This patient was diagnosed with COVID positive pneumonia, but his TBC showed um, uh, marked anemia and moderate thrombocytopenia, and he came in with an acute kidney injury. Having a closer look at his um, labs, we do have evidence of hemolysis. He has, in addition to the anemia, he has high, high reticulocytic count, high bilirubin, low haptoglobin, and high LGH. And serum protein electrophoresis showed um, an eight gram per liter, like a small M protein. Um, imaging showed uh, a hypoechoic mass that's vascular in the urinary bladder at the urethrovesical junction and a mild splenomegaly. TT abdomen showed mild obstructive hydronephrosis uh, and back pressure to, due to that mass in the bladder. This is a picture of the CT abdomen here with the arrow showing the mass that the patient had on the left side of the bladder. Um, continuing uh, the workup of the patient because of the anemia and the hemolytic profile, we did a DAT test which came back negative. So it's a DAT negative hemolytic anemia and the patient was started from prednisone. Um, the small monoclonal protein was just an IgM MGUS and work up was, more workup was done as a bone marrow and aspirate and biopsy to rule out an indolent nephroma that's inciting this in hemolytic anemia and AMGAS. And URBT was planned with our urologists. So this is a low power view of the uh, TURBT or the transurethral resection of the bladder tumor. And as we can see, there are papillary fronts at this power and they are thickened and they show a lot of layers of cells. Uh, a more medium power view is showing that those cells have hyperchromatic nuclei, they are pleomorphic uh, in terms of the nuclear size, and there are a lot of mitotic figures that we can appreciate on, on this power. This case was shown at, uh, at our tumor boards or our, sorry, our, at our consensus rounds, and we noticed like a funny appearance uh, happening in the lamina propria of those uh, TURBT blocks. And we can see here the urethral, um, the high-grade papillary urothelial carcinoma, but there is something else going on in the lamina propria with those dark cells that we were suspicious. Could this be um, an invasion or something else? A higher power view here is showing um, that those cells look slightly different if we compare them in the second upper right slide than the high-grade urothelial carcinoma. They are more discotesive more hyperchromatic, and the mitotic figures are more pronounced than the background urothelial carcinoma. So can we bring um, the first poll, Jenny, please? Sure, just come in. Thank you. So in your opinion, those atypical cells in the lamina propria, do they represent invasive urothelial carcinoma? a hematolymphoid process, a lymphovascular invasion from this urothelial carcinoma or artifactual and detached cells. 
so yeah so that's interesting so most of the most of the opinions are hematolymphoid process a few people are thinking this could be an invasive urothelial carcinoma um, so let me take you through the immunohistochemical stains that we did on this case so we did a pancreatin stain and it came back negative in this lamina propria um, cluster of cells Gata 3 was also negative, which excludes urothelial carcinoma by all means. And you were right, this is a hematolymphoid process, and, and I'll take you through what we did to, um, to further delineate that. So this case was reported, this case was um, seen by one of my surgical pathology colleagues. And as you know, as a hematopathologist, we get um, a lot of cases shown to us when there is a question about the hematolymphoid process. So um, this was reported as a high-grade papillary urothelial carcinoma with no definitive features of invasion given the stains and the morphology and no LVI. And this was pending further workup. So I took over the case. I suggested to do CD20. I'll show you the results in a second. And then I looked back in retrograde to this patient uh, to see the bone marrow and all what was done for the patient. So the patient had a hypercellular bone marrow, the lymphocytes, um, and the plasma cells were slightly increased. Lymphocytes were 29%. The bone marrow cellularity, as you can see, is increased for the patient's age. It's about 80% cellular. And there were a lot of lymphoid aggregates. Some of them were interstitial, and some of them were hugging the bone, as we see in this case. And they were mostly formed of small lymphocytes in the paratrabecular areas with some intervening or intermingled plasma cells. Um, this is CD3, uh, CD20, um, showing that those, this is actually a B cell process con constituting about 70% of the bone marrow nucleated cells. And the background CD3 is just showing few cells. IgM was diffusely positive if we compare it to IgA and I IgG on the upper part of the screen. And the plasma cells showed a skewed kappa light chain if we compare that to the lambda, although they were not so much increased if we look at the CD138, but still they were monoclonal. So this uh, bone marrow aspect was reported um, as a monoclonal um, B cell population, and it was CD5 negative, 10 negative, with Ig kappa restriction, and MYD88 was um, was pending at the time. Then it came back positive. So this was a lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma with 70% involvement of the bone marrow. But if we go back to our TURBT, the cells in the lamina propria looked different than this process. So um, I assume that the patient has two different processes happening at the same time. So CD20, as we see here in the areas that were keratin negative or CD20 positive on low power and on um, slightly higher power. And then again, looking at the morphology, they look discohesive and they have this uh, high mitotic activity. CD10 was negative, CD5 was positive, BCL6 positive, and MAM1 positive. Um, interestingly, those, um, these, those atypical B lymphoid cells showed kappa light chain restriction. KI67, as we see on the left lower side, is high, and BCL2 is positive. We had very limited material to work with, but this is what we got to the end, that this is a large B cell lymphoma, and we favored intravascular B cell lymphoma and um, recommended further staging because the patient was not known to have other uh, sites of, of lymphoma. Um, so his autoimmune hemolytic anemia was treated with prednisone, his LPL was watch and wait, and his, for in his intravascular lymphoma, he got uh, six cycles of r shock and he was doing um, okay um, for, for about a year. And then on follow-up, um, so this patient just passed away, unfortunately, yesterday when I was preparing this presentation and looking up the history. So although, although the staging did not show areas of involvement initially, he did get um, CNS involvement. And as we know that those cases are difficult to, uh, to stage because they are not mass forming and they are mostly in, uh, involving the sinusoids and vessels in different, in different organs. So this is from the WHO book, the fourth edition. It's showing that this type of lymphoma is seen mostly in the veins, capillaries, and vascular channels of different organs. 
Um, it typically involves the presence with the cutaneous involvement and also with the CNS involvement. It has an aggressive, um, aggressive course and it has it does not have a very good prognosis. Um, and, the, and as we see, the patients would have large cells with irregular nuclei, frequent mitotic figures. And if we do an examination of a bone marrow, liver, or spleen, they would typically be in the sinusoids, and they would have this characteristic look of a sinusoidal involvement. CD5 is commonly positive in those types, and CD10 and MUN1 are also positive if the CD10 is negative. Um, uh, that's it for the first case. I'll move to the second case and then I'm going to take questions in the end. So the second case is an 82-year-old female patient who has um, a significant uh, pack year smoking history. And she came to our hospital with four months of generalized decline, weight loss, and weakness. Um, the CPC was relevant for a mild leukocytosis, marked anemia, which was NYD, um, and mild um, thrombocytosis. Hypercalcemia was the thing that attracted the, the clinicians to look for either um, a parathyroid hormone increase or a malignancy that's causing the hypercalcemia. LDH was normal and albumin was slightly low. So the two working diagnoses were marked anemia and hypercalcemia. The patient went ahead and did imaging. So the CT chest showed a right upper lobe lung mass, which was quite large at 14 centimeter with right hyalur lymphadenopathy. And an upper endoscopy was performed just to um, try to detect if there is a source of her anemia uh, in terms of upper or lower GI bleed. And the findings were in the upper endoscopy was, were, were erythema of both the gastric body and antrum, and a one centimeter firm subcutaneous nodule at the cardia. Um, this nodule was not biopsied, but I'm gonna show you the biopsy from the gastric body and antrum. The lung was biopsied, and as it was expected, it was a non-small um, cell lung carcinoma, favor squamous cell carcinoma. And because of the age of the patient, um, the family decided just to go for comfort measures. So the patient, um, even the radiation oncologist, did not want to go ahead and treat the patient because of other comorbidities. And so the finding in um, the gastric antrum, as we see, this is the gastric antral mucosa, and there are um, a lot of pink-like or xenophilic inclusions in the background of the lamina propria. On a slightly higher power or medium power, we can see that those cells, um, those inclusions are actually within cells. If we look closely, the, the nuclei are pushed to one side. So these look like intracytoplasmic inclusions or intracytoplasmic uh, amorphous material that we will talk about in, in a couple of seconds. The body of um, the biopsy of the body, the gastric body, also showed focal areas with this high line or this is anophilic material. PAS, we did a, a bunch of special stains and immunostains. So this is the PAS, which is showing that those inclusions are, um, are positive for PAS. Um, Jenny, can we bring please the second poll? Yes. Thank you. Okay. So what do you think the xenophilic globulins of the labina propria are? Are they light chains or amyloid or mucin or macrophages? Macrophages, I mean like a Whipple disease type of, type of thing. Yeah, that's interesting. This, there is quite a dispersion in the, in the opinions between light chain, amyloid, mucin, and macrophages. Um, okay, so let's, let's move on. I'll show you some interesting findings, and then we will talk about this, this finding. So this case also was, um, was seen by one of my surgical pathology colleagues, and then it was, it was shown and at rounds, and I, I took over the case to continue the workup. Um, so I'll show you first some immunostains, and then I'll tell you what those inclusions are. So the MUM1 was positive, as we see here in the nuclei of those cells, where the material in the cytoplasm was pushing the nucleus to one side. Um, and I did see what the CD130, it was not as clear. Um, so I assumed that the MUM1 was good enough to assume that those are plasma cells. I did see D68 just to exclude that those are macrophages, but as we see here, most of those cells were negative for uh, histiocytic markers, although there are histiocytes in the background. 
but not necessarily around those um, isinophilic globules. This is uh, immunoglobulin kappa light chain, which is showing that all those inclusions are positive for IgG kappa and negative for IgG lambda if you look closely at, um, at the globules. There were background plasma cells, and those plasma cells were polyclonal for kappa and lambda, so I'm just focusing more on the inclusions to see if those are monoclonal or not, and they are IgG kappa cloning. Um, interestingly, also IgM kappa was positive, and I'm not showing pictures, but the IgA and the IgG looked exactly like the IgG lambda, and they were negative for uh, the immunoglobulin stain. Um, because people were interested in amyloid as well, which is a good thought because it's in one of the differential diagnoses, so the Congo rat came back negative, so these inclusions are not amyloid. So um, the isinophilic globules are actually light chains, as, as we did uh, prove that they are inside plasma cells that are um, pushed up by, by those inclusions and by um, confirming with MAM1, CD138 stains, and also by the immunoglobulin kappa and IgM chain. Mucin was negative. I didn't show the pictures. And we proved also that those are not necrophages. So um, there is something relevant here that I will talk about in a second, but H. pylori is recommended in those cases, and the patient was negative for H. pylori in both the body and the antrum. So this case was signed out um, as plasma cell infiltrate with monoclonal light chain, kappa light chain, with no helobacter pylori organisms. And as I told you, the patient was very old, and um, they were not planning to treat her by any means, so even uh, the hematopathology, the hematology consultation was not referred, so we were just pursuing this finding as one of the interesting findings, but there was nothing done in this regard for this patient. So I looked at um, her immunology screening were all pending at the time when this case was signed out, but they came later and they showed a free kappa and lambda that were increased, but the ratio was normal. All the immunoglobulins were normal. And the immunofixation showed two M proteins that were slightly different than the one we were seeing in the stomach. So they were IgG kappa and free lambda. So not IgG um, uh, kappa as we, not IgM kappa as we were finding on our, on our histology slides. So I searched the literature. I've seen one similar case during our uh, unknown rounds at Mount Sinai with Dr. Riddell. So I, I searched again to see what this entity was called. So I found a few uh, case reports and a small case series where they call this Russell body gastritis. So this is one of the cases from 2013 showing nice pictures similar to our pictures. Um, and they call this um, Russell body gastritis. This patient is uh, a 74 year old female who came in with um, hematemesis and a gastric ulcer. The, the urea breath test showed positive for H. pylori. And one month later, uh, after the patient took proton pump inhibitors and treatment, there was a follow-up biopsy that was done and the ulcer was healed. But the finding, as we see in the picture, were all those cells that were pushed up with uh, isinophilic globules, just as our case. Uh, CD138 was nicely done in this case, and it was showing positive plasma cells that were engulfing or having those Russell bodies within them, and they called them MOT cells. Uh, IgM was positive and Ig kappa were positive, just like our case. So this was monoclonal, um, light chain deposition, and the PAS was positive, but the pictures were not shown in the article. Uh, another case report from 2019 about Russell body gastritis was a 28-year-old male patient who was HIV positive, and he presented with abdominal pain and vomiting, and um, an endoscopy showed gastric edema and erythema. Biopsies were um, negative for H. pylori, but showed this chronic inactive inflammation. And focally, there were those isinophilic globules as well. And on the right side, we can see that the plasma cells in this patient were polyclonal for both kappa and lambda um, light chains. So I know that we're coming to an end. This is just a, sum, uh, a summary of, of the findings um, about Russell's body gastritis. So this is a benign, rare condition that's incidental, reactive, um, and most of the time is polyclonal, but can be monoclonal as our case. 
the things that we might need to pay attention to when we encounter this case is that those cases are frequently but not consistently um, associated with Helicobacter pylori, HIV, EBV, or any other infection. And the important thing is that they can be associated concomitantly or subsequently by mouth lymphoma, gastric adenocarcinoma, MGUS, or plasma cell neoplasm. So the patient should be looked um, up or followed up for those uh, like events that may happen with the presentation or after. Um, a couple of theories that the chronic prostritis can be due to under secretion of immunoglobulins by plasma cells or overproduction of plasma cells with increased formation of Russell bodies. Um, the presentation is mostly in the antrum with erythema and it could be with also with nodularity. Um, just to sum up, a take home message is avoid this, avoid misdiagnosing those as signet ring adenocarcinoma. We did keratin, which was negative. Um, look for adenomas, carcinomas, or plasma cell neoplasm, and do H. pylori um, IHC because this is a common association. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sarah. That was great. Um, I see we're coming up on the hour. Is there any any questions from anyone in anyone online uh, for Sarah? I don't see. There was any. a question in the chat uh, from Roland. Oh yeah, that's right. Is there in the gastric biopsy was there any significant CD20 or CD21 staining any fish scent? Um, actually, we didn't do CD20 in this case. We had very limited material, so we pursued what whatever I showed today just to prove that this is not an adenocarcinoma, um, and that the plasma cells that were seen in the background were polyclonal, but no fish was sent. Um, and especially that the patient was not going to be treated anyway, so we did not want to incur more costs, but that's interesting, but no, we didn't. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, I, I want to take the opportunity to thank all of the presenters today. Um, it was a really nice uh, community of interest uh, presentation, and uh, I also wanted to mention that in the chat, there is a link to fill out the evaluation survey. It will also be emailed to everybody. Uh, that presented today. In order to get your CME certificate, you need to fill out the evaluation. So um, if you if you uh, can fill out the evaluation, that would be great. It's always very helpful. We thank everybody for your participation. And we hope to see you again at a future community of interest presentation. Thanks so much and uh, see everybody soon.